Okay, so we're recording. How, how are you going this morning? Fog everywhere and you still manage to make, make it through. Ho hopefully this won't feel totally like fog, but uh, uh, 9 o'clock on a Monday morning, though, uh, I imagine everyone's still slightly waking up, or at least I am. Um, okay, so quick recap for the people watching the video who weren't here. So in the tutorial, we did that exercise where we looked at a whole bunch of different games, and we just started from this question of what's the stuff that's in them, and what do we need to know about the stuff that's in them, so that we could think about things, and what properties they have, uh, the sort of messages they respond to, uh, responded to, which tended to turn into functions, and um, the uh, situations where you know we, we modeled that monster where it changed state. It was patrolling, and then later on, if someone got close enough, it would start chasing you. And then if it got close enough that it was in range, it would start attacking you. And then if it defeated you, it would go hurrah and go off patrolling for the next victim. Um, so that's kind of a quick recap on, on, on the tutorial. And we were sketching little bits just up on the whiteboard, and we weren't doing any code at that point. Um, what we're going to try and do this week, we're going to try and write another game through the two lectures and the tutorial, which will then lead into uh, Mitch trying to get the thing working over the network the following week. So we were sort of leading towards network programming. But as our programs start to get larger, we're going to need to start to um, organize them a little bit. Uh, keep things where we know to find them so it doesn't all become a great tangle of spaghetti. And when we want to change something, we can't find where to change it. And so that was why the tutorial was going on about, oh, let's start thinking, thinking about stuff. Now, the game that we're going to head to, and we're not going to get it all done, certainly not today, probably not all by Wednesday. Uh, there might even be quite a bit that you need to finish off in the tutorial. Um, but where asteroids was um, in, you know, things floating randomly through space, I thought, let's do one that's on a bit of a grid, uh, a little bit like the, 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 the labyrinth one that I, the, that I showed. And here I've not written all of it, but we've got a grid of a map, and uh, we've got the dark grey ones are floor tiles, and they're passable. And the greenish ones are wall tiles, and they're not passable. And we have our blobby monster going along, uh, looking hopefully suitably blobby and menacing. And so we'll probably get about that far. And uh, we'll also want to add the player in and decide, oh, well, OK, how do we want to gamify this? How do we want to make it fun? Um, but that's, that blobby monster is the thing that right now it's on patrol. And eventually, we'd like it to be able to start chasing you if you get too close. OK, so that's where we're headed. But to do that, so this is the code that I've written, but I'm going to create a new one. And we'll sort of, if you like, re, um, rediscover how to write that, but use this as crib notes. Uh, I haven't written the hero yet. Uh, the monster is, oh, that's about 193 lines of code. So there is a bit of code in there. The game map's another. 54, so, and I think there's a bit more in tile. So we're looking at about ooh, just, just under 300 lines of code all up at the moment. But let's also use this to start talking about ways that we can organize our code. Uh, processing is based on Java, which is an object-oriented language. And so the way it does organizing your stuff is using object-oriented concepts. So we'll talk through some of those. OK, so on campus, groups all looked at the game and thought about what items are in the game, what are the states we need to keep track of, what are the messages or events that happen to different things, is there anything that behaves differently depending on what states it's in, and we just wrote this up on the whiteboard pretty much. Well, sticky notes to start with, and then sketching things on whiteboards and chatted about it. And you'll tend to find, so this is a photo actually from a user experience design consultancy. Uh, that board is full of sticky notes. In this case, it's observations about, us uh, about users and the problem, and what on earth is this thing that we're trying to design? What's it supposed to do? Um, but uh, if you go to lots of software shops, you will see walls full of sticky notes for all sorts of things. 
And you know, they're nice and small. You can move them around. You can scribble on them. They're up on the wall where everyone in the, in the, in the programming team can, can see them and can go and peer at them. Um, so they're a handy, handy sort of communication tool in that way. Uh, so there's a lot of stuff that is done in very lightweight forms of documentation these days. Um, that is a uh, uh, grabbed off the internet. That's actually a, a stock photo from one of these, these places that does stock photos for startups. Uh, but so there's sticky notes and there's someone scribbling that's just designed on a whiteboard. Um, when you find yourself working in teams later on and you're co-located, you'll find yourself scribbling on whiteboards a lot to try and talk things through. Now, so nefarious ulterior motive. Um, it's not just that we're doing this because that's what companies do. Keeping your code organized helps keep it manageable. Um, so this was one of the things I was stressing last week. Uh, if you have a function that is 100, times, 100 lines long versus one that is 10 times long, it's more than a factor of 10 difference in terms of tangliness, in that every line in your code could have some awkward interaction with some later on line of code. And so if you're scrolling about through pages of stuff, you'll soon find that you have more different paths and edge cases to deal with than you can keep easily in your head, and that changing something in your code becomes this kind of tricky weaving operation where you're going, oh, I'm going to change it there, oh, blast, I'm going to change this bit down here. Um, so if we can organize things, we can also keep them small, and then we can see what's happening, and we can make our debugging an awful lot easier. Um, so we're not going to do a lot of upfront design. I don't like massive specification documents. Time's gone by. It used to be that programmers would get a specification document land whoop on their desk, and they'd have to um, start trying to make it work. Um, but we, we, we'll get in the habits of just keeping things organized as we go. And the other thing we're going to do, lots of people think of the compiler as their enemy. The compiler is not. The compiler is not there to tell you off. The compiler is your friend. The compiler is the thing that, if you use it right, can tell you really quickly if you've got something obviously wrong. There is no possible way that could work because you're treating this thing as a string and actually it's going to be an int. Um, the compiler is there to be pedantic so that you don't have to manually be pedantic all the time. It, it, is, your, it, it is your pedantic friend. Um, Later on, you'll find yourself sketching fewer diagrams because you'll be used to sketching things in code. And roughly speaking, that's what I'm going to do today because mm, I realized, you know, oh, we've only got about an hour and a half, right, this whole thing um, in, terms of, in terms of lecture time. And for some of it, I'm talking to slides. Uh, but small enough to put on a card is often a good aim. And here's a picture of the game that I played when I was little that sort of inspired this. So that's a game called Labyrinth, um, which has all of these screens that have, have rooms that are on a grid. Monsters, different monsters beetle around in different ways. The thing you can't see in there is you've also got a block. And some of the, um, some of the, some of the monsters you can only get rid of by pushing the block on top of them. And other ones you can only get rid of by shooting them. Um, and some of them will try and shoot your block onto you. Um, so there, there, there's kind of a, a few fun little things, even though it was a little 8-bit game in, 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 on, on, on a grid. So what are some things? Let's start modeling. I reckon that for this, we're going to need our, our map, the, the, the room made up of tiles. And some of them are going to be passable, and some of them aren't, um, that, we, that we saw before. And we're going to need a monster. And this monster, well, if we looked at how I'd got it done before, that monster didn't just pop between the squares. It actually glides. So sometimes the monster is actually halfway across two squares. So we're going to try and make the animations of the monsters kind of smooth and slightly menacing. Slightly menacing. And we need our hero, but we probably won't have to get that far today. Right, how do we model these in code? Well, let's start off by, so I don't just keep popping to, here's one I read it, read, wrote earlier. Let's create a new one. And let's save this as undermine, and I'm just going to call it in class. 
elf a labyrinth. All right. Now, one of the things I do recall is that processing has this odd habit that until you've got set up and draw in your code, nothing else really is going to work. It starts giving spurious um, compile errors in other, in other classes for some reason. So let's just make sure that we've got those lines in there. And all that does at the moment is put up a blank canvas. OK, so that's, that's not doing anything hugely particular. Right, how do we model these in code? The next thing I'm going to do is, so down here, have you been keeping your code mostly in one file or in lots of files so far? Who's been keeping it in one file? Almost everyone. Who's been keeping it in lots of files? No, no hands going up. OK, so this is the new bit. We're spreading our code across a few different files in different places, and we're going to, to, to try and keep it small so that we, we, if we want to change the thing about the monster, we know to go to the monster bit. We don't have to scroll through reams of code. Um, so I'll create one for the monster. And we're going to need to introduce this term here, class monster, because processing is based on Java. Java is object-oriented, and the class is or an object-oriented concept. So um, who's heard of classes before? You have to, oh, almost everyone. OK. I must apologize that I am going to bore you ever so slightly, because some of the people off campus won't have. Um, so the very short recap that I tend to have is that classes are some kind of thing, and that objects are instances of, of a kind of thing. And so, for example, I have a dog called Rosie. Uh, and so I could model that by saying there's a class of thing called dog. And dogs have, have names. And I have an instance of a dog. And its name is Rosie. Um, and if we wanted to model that in code, it would look about like this. So we've said there is a class of thing called dog. And uh, we've said it has a property, which is a string, which is called its name. And we've got this special kind of function here called a constructor. And that takes a parameter, which in this case is also called name. And some of the, one of the things to realize is that this name is not the same as this name. My default. This is an argument to that constructor method, whereas this is a property on the, uh, on the class. And until we say otherwise, those are two different things. They just happen to overload the same term. And inside the constructor, if you like, this one wins. If we say name, it'll think we're talking about the argument that's being passed into the function. But if we say this, this thing that we're in, we're being, this method's being called on an object, and this talks about this object here, we can say this dot name. So that's that name there, and set it to be equal to this name here. So it's kind of a, a pattern that you'll see very often, that we, that we end up not bothering to, uh, to name that differently than this one. We actually end up naming it the same, so we can then just say this dot that equals this one. So fairly common pattern in setting up classes. And then later on, well, now that I've defined what a dog is, dog becomes a type, and I can have a variable which has the type reference to a dog. And so I've got a, a, a reference to a dog here called Rosie. And I've said that that is a new dog. And that's how we create an object to this class. And it calls this constructor to set it up. And I've passed in the name Rosie. And so it's then gone, this dot name is, is, is Rosie. And now I've got a dog whose name is Rosie. And I could print out its name. OK, sorry, that was kind of reinventing the wheel for you guys because you'd come across this before. But I, I'm not sure that everyone has. OK, so next kind of trot, quick trot through OOO programming. Classes also let you define methods. Um, so far as we're concerned, this is basically a way of grouping functions next to the sorts of things they belong to. 
Uh, you'll find out all sorts of fancy stuff like encapsulation later. So far as we're concerned at the moment, uh, it's mostly about putting things into places where we'll know to look for them. So for example, uh, if we wanted to say that dogs can be told to sit, then maybe we'd have a method called sit that is defined on a dog. So I can say, Rosie, sit. OK. Jumping on, we're going to get quite far into an OO program. Interface is the last bit that I'm going to come up with. So an interface is a little contract. And to fulfill the contract, classes have to have these methods. So a dog isn't the only thing that I could ask to sit. Uh, I was trying to think of another example. The best one that came to mind was Harry Potter uh, with house elves, the, the, the creatures in the kitchens in Harry Potter that uh, for some reason are particularly insistent that they need to be told what to do by people. Um, and, and so we could have a, a class called house elf and so we then also implement a method called sit on that. And now dogs and house elves can be told to sit. And what I've done here is up here I've said there is an interface can be asked to sit. And it has this contract. Things that are implement this interface have a method called sit. Uh, this doesn't have a body. There's just a semicolon there. There's no open curly brace and here's, here's a definition of it. It is just the contract that says things that can be asked to sit have a method called sit. And this one implements can be asked to sit and has a method called sit. And this one implements can be asked to sit and has a method called sit. So things can be asked to sit have a method called sit. The reason we do that is because then this also becomes a type. And so we can talk about can be asked to sit rather than just talking about dogs and house elves. And so, for example, we can have an array of things that can be asked to sit. And that's, you know, that, that is a, a, this is a, a, a type in an array like you've seen arrays earlier. So instead of ints, instead of objects, instead of squares, this is an array of things that can be asked to sit. And we can put house elves into it, and we can put dogs into it. And the compiler won't complain about that. But if I go and create a class called cat, and it doesn't implement can be asked to sit, and I go and try and put a cat in there, I'll say, oh, you can't ask a cat to sit, not putting that in that array. And so that's where the compiler can tell us if we're doing something that is obviously wrong. You're putting a cat into an array of things that can be asked to sit, and it can't. OK. That was a quick potted introduction to object-oriented programming. I've probably covered about half of COSC 120 in about five minutes. So it could have been quite quick, but if you've come across it before, it could have been a, um, a little bit, uh, oh, gosh, I, I know all this. So let's get back to our game. Um, tiles. I think, are something abstract. We want to be able to talk about floor tiles that you can walk over. We want to be able to talk about wall tiles that you can bump into. But there's not a tile that's not a floor tile or a wall tile or an exploding tile or uh, something else. And so tiles, I think, is going to be an abstract uh, concept. And so it's going to be one of these contracts. It's going to, it's going to be look, a tile has some stuff that we need to know about. We need to know if it's passable. And we'd like to, to be able to draw itself. And so let's say we have an interface called tile. And we have a method on it called is passable. So I can ask it, are you passable? And we have a method saying, draw yourself. And I've given this an x and a y to say, draw yourself at this grid position. So let's go create tile. And let's grab that. So we now have an interface for our tiles. But we haven't created any tiles yet. Um, the next thing I want to do, I talked about a moment ago, well, I said that I'm going to ask it to draw itself at a grid position. But eventually, I've got to get it to actually draw itself on the screen. And the screen wants to know pixels. It doesn't know it wants to know grid array 3,7. It wants to know pixel location 300 by 
70 or whatever it is. And so, you know, I'm not just going to model these tiles strictly in terms of modeling the real world. I'm going to say, well, okay, our grid is really defined by how big our tiles are. The monsters have to fit on a tile as well. And so maybe this tile interface might be a good obvious spot to put my number for how big tiles are. So that if I want to go and change it or I want to go and look it up somewhere else in my code, I've got one spot that I know it's in. And so let's put this static int sprite height into the interface. Uh, who's come across static before? Yep. OK, almost everyone that's done the OO stuff before. No, not, not too surprising there. Um, what static means, uh, for people on the video who might not have come across that, back over here, if I wanted to print Rosie's name or ask Rosie to set, I needed to create a new dog called Rosie. But static on this sprite height uh, means, look, it doesn't belong to any particular tile. It is just a variable that is grouped under the namespace of tile. So I can just say tile with capital T, you know, this interface dot sprite height. So it's not that that belongs to a tile. That is grouped under the concept of tiles. Uh, it, it, it's in that namespace. All right. Now let's create a floor tile. And so this is going to be our first concrete one that's going to implement the contract. And so we're going to have some stuff that is about, you know, we've said that it implements this contract, and there we are implementing this contract. But we've also got some stuff that's common to floor tiles. So somehow I want to give it a shape to draw itself, and I figured let's do the easiest thing is um, that what we're going to do is when you create the floor tile, we will create a shape uh, that is a rectangle, that is the height and width of the tile, and we will set it to be kind of a dark grayish color. And then, when we ask you to draw, uh, you know, we ask the tile to draw itself at a particular location, well, we can translate that grid location uh, into a pixels on the screen by multiplying it by the size of tiles. And, uh, and so then we should be able to just say, draw the shape at this pixel location, and it should draw itself. Thing to remember, processing doesn't like you to call any of the create methods until after setup is called. So this means that we're not going to be able to create any floor tiles until after we've called setup. Otherwise, we'll get a null pointer exception. Is X's initial value 1 or 0? Sorry? Is X's initial value? Well, so X here is a, it's an argument that comes into the method. So it doesn't have an initial value. It has whatever value is passed into this method. So x might be 17. It might be whatever we happen to be called with. You're not passing x to it, even though you're passing by sprite height. So this x here is this x here. And so it is an argument into the function. So later on, I'm going to say my tile. I'm not just going to say draw. I'm going to say draw of 0, 1, in which case x is 0 and y is 1. And then this down here is 0 times sprite height, which is 0. And this is 1 times sprite height, which is sprite height. And so that's how the location is going to be passed through. So eventually, there's going to be something outside of this that's calling my tile.draw that's going to be controlling what my x and y's are going to be. OK, so uh, hopefully I've not got too many typos in there, because I think I typed that by hand into the, into the slide. We'll find out. We'll find out if my compiler complains. Let, let, well, let's, let's hit play. Is it happy with everything so far? It's happy with everything so far. We're not actually creating any floor tiles yet, but at least the compiler's happy that they, they aren't uh, interminably broken. All right. So. Next thing to do, let's get some floor tiles into the game. Let's start modeling our game state and um, so that we can actually draw something and get something up on the screen, because I've just been talking to bits of code without running them for far too long now. 
Um, so, things I decided, just as design things, I would like our tiles to come from an array of numbers, because that's easy to edit. I can just have their and, and, and bash away at it. But if that's the case, I'm going to need to know, all right, you said one. What sort of tile is one? Um, and so I need to know what number maps to what sort of tile. And I need to keep the actual grid of tiles, the array of numbers, and later on, we'll worry about a monster and a hero. But for the moment, let's just get the grid up. So let's start modeling our game state. And this is I'm also going to model as a class. So we're going to have an object that is our game state. We've got to define what that object looks like. And so there's a class called game state. I think I called it game map in the original one that I was doing. So, who, who's seen a, one of those before, a hash map? Nobody's seen a hash map before. Uh, OK. So arrays let you have a sequence of things one after the other. But suppose I want you to have an entry for one, an entry for seven, and an entry for five million, and nothing else. It would be really, really inefficient to have a thing that is five million long just to keep those three. Um, or suppose, instead, I want to be able to look things up by their names. So Fred is this object. Joe is that object. Fred and Joe are strings. They're not numbers. So I can't index into an array based on a string. So there's another kind of... Um, structure, kind of data structure, which most languages have built in, uh, which tends to get, it gets called a map because it maps keys to values. And so here, we might say our key number one corresponds to a floor tile. Our key number zero, or a wall tile, our key number zero corresponds to a floor tile. Uh, and so that way, if you like, they're sparse. They've got the ones that you put in there, but they don't have a whole bunch of empty cells for things that you haven't put in there. I'm not going to go into the structure behind it as to how these are kept, because there's different ones. There's different ways of storing these things in memory. Um, that's a concept for kind of late, late, later on, for, for later units. We'll go into great depth in. Um, but a hash map is uh, of these sorts of maps, it's kind of the go-to easiest one to deal with. Uh, and it has a way of storing these keys against these values and a way that you can then give it the key and get the value. All right, and so this is going to map that one is a wall tile and zero is a floor tile. This here is our grid of tiles. And I've written it out this way so that it'll be nice and easy for me to edit. Um, so, oops, let's put a comma in there, and let's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and then let's put one that's got all wall at the end. So as you look at that, if you imagine 0 being floor and 1 being wall, that already kind of looks like a map, which is, uh, you know, like a grid. Uh, so that's why I want it to be edited this way. But the, what this actually is, is a two-dimensional array, an array of arrays. And I asked in the tutorial, had anyone done two-dimensional arrays or not? And I looked through your notes, and it wasn't there. So let's very quickly explain two-dimensional arrays. Um, one of the things to say, programmers like it when things compose well. Two-dimensional arrays in processing in Java are an awful lot easier than you might imagine. If, this is an, if an array of ints involves putting square brackets after int, and you can define, define it like that, then an array, array of array of ints is int brackets, 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 brackets. And just as we could say open curly brace and fill it with values this way, in our array of arrays, we can open curly brace, close curly brace, and fill it with values. But because this is an array of arrays, 
the values we're filling it with are arrays that we fill by open curly brace and putting the values in. So stuff just nests, it just composes by, the, by those rules. So if, you, if I wanted a three-dimensional one, another set of square brackets, another set of curly braces, structures uh, uh, going in underneath. So in this, this map here, it's an array of arrays, and the elements in that array, uh, in that array of arrays, are arrays, and that's, if you like, that is map of zero, is there. That array is map of one. That array is map of two. Now that means if I want to do map of two comma three, it's O one two, that array, uh, three, O one two three, is that one there. If I want to do map of three of three, then it's O one two three. Oh, oh, one, two, three, the one underneath. So that means that actually the y value is coming first. The column one is coming first. And it's coming first because I've laid it out like this so that I can make it look visually like a, a, a grid when I, when I edit it this way. Um, but so it does mean that we will very often, when we look things up, end up having to go array of arrays of y to get the row out, and then of x to get the number out. So just beware, that is why we'll see some things backwards. Um, next thing I'm going to do, I'm going to stick the height and width of our, um, of our grid into a variable, uh, just so I can refer to it easily. And so the height is, well, the height is the number of rows in our array of arrays. And so that is going to be map.length. And the width, well, the width is going to be how wide one of these is. And here I'm having to rely on the fact that I've been nice and conventional with myself because I can't just go map.length because that was the height. Instead, I'm going to have to go and get the first one out of it and get its length, and that's the width. And that means I'm going to be relying on the fact that I've got the first element, that I haven't, if you like, gone and set up my array like that, in which case I'd suddenly get an index out of bounds on element zero. There is no map of zero to ask for its length. And I'm also relying on that I've been conventional and I haven't done something like that and had the first one be longer than the rest. OK. Now, a little bit more machinery. We need to set up what, mam what number maps to what tile. Over in this one's constructor, or in fact, I can do this straight off when, it's, uh, when, when I'm declaring the class. I can say that that is a new hash map that is going to map integers to tiles and create it. Um, but. I'm going to need to actually put the elements into the map to say one is a floor tile, two is a, um, two is a wall tile, or whatever. So let's give this one a constructor. And just to keep things in one place, let's go put this into the constructor. And then let's go tile map dot put of zero is new floor tile and let's go create a wall tile we're at while we're at it. I haven't got a wall tile yet. Let's go give us a wall tile. Well a wall tile is going to be much like a floor tile except it's not going to be passable. Uh, false. Oh, and I need to change the constructor to say this is a wall tile. And it's still going to draw itself by drawing its shape, but now I'm going to change its uh, color to be kind of a muddy brown. Okay. 
Now that one's kind of happy. Let's just press play. Make sure I haven't broken anything. But it's still going to be blank. It's still going to be blank. I still haven't created a bunch of stuff. Let's pop over here. Somewhere along the lines, we're now going to need to um, create a game state. So let's have game state GS and in our setup. And well, now we want to ask our game state to draw itself, really. Which means I need to go and define a draw method on game state. And so let's just pop down here. And so this bit's a little bit like knitting. We're just threading the methods that we need into the right places. All right. Let's draw this. You guys, you guys have all done programming before, before this unit, which is uh, kind of cool. But as many people might not have. So how, what do you reckon our, our draw is going to do on our game state? going to display the tiles. So we're going to need to loop through our map, drawing, asking the tiles to draw themselves. And we've now said that 0 corresponds to a floor tile, and 1 corresponds to a wall tile. You'll kind of notice I've cheated, and I've only created one floor tile, and I've only created one wall tile. And I am just asking them, going to ask them to draw themselves at particular locations, depending on the number that's in that map. So let's go for... Would you have to change tiles on map with four more tiles than one? Oh, yes, thank you. Well spotted. Well spotted. I haven't... I mapped zero to both of them. Uh, which, what would have happened was actually it would just have meant that zero was mapped to, to uh, the second one that I put in there, and it would have complained bitterly as soon as I asked it for a number one. It would have said, no such element exception. Bang. Well spotted. Thank you. All right, let's go for int x equals 0. Um, x is less than the width, x plus plus. And inside that loop, so for each, hmm, oh well, I'm, I'm iterating the, 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 the columns first. I'm iterating across and then down. Never mind, that won't matter. Um, for int y equals 0, y is less than the height, y plus plus. And now, what we're going to do is this. Oops. I called that tiles there. Never mind. Let's. Oops. Sorry, what is it? that one there? Tiles. Sorry, I realized I'd taken the word map off there so it didn't get confused with that map. And so that means this needs to become tiles is new hash map. Tiles dot put. Tiles dot put. All right. This line here is doing a bunch of stuff. Shall I ask one of you, what, what, what's it doing? Can I rudely wake you up at the front? I should probably ask him. No, okay. <laughs> I, I, shall, I shall rudely ask the person in the stripey, uh, stripey card again. <laughs> um, it'll go through the whole array of arrays and then it'll go through the whole array of arrays and then it'll go through the whole array of arrays and then it'll go through the whole array of arrays. Yeah, okay. So, map of y, comma, x. So, these, these two are numbers. That's our x index and our y index. Map of y of x is, yeah, it's going to get a number for that corresponding position out of here. Tiles dot get of that number is then going to look up in here to see what sort of tile was that number mapped to. And once we've got the tile, we're then asking it to draw itself at x comma y at that grid position. So this is where, where we were saying what was x, what was y earlier. Um, it's actually this bit of code here is controlling what x is and what y is when we're asking the tiles to draw themselves. Ah, 
Ha! <laughs> we have a grid. Yay! It took, uh, took us about half an hour, but we've got some stuff on screen. It won't take about half an hour because I was talking through every bit, bit as, as we were going. Um, all right. Let's see how far we get on the rest. Um, so, we're sort of running out of slides here because I was predicting that, ooh, it sounds like by that stage we'll be getting a bit close to time. And theoretically, we've only got six minutes left. So we will start putting the monster in, and we'll see if we can get it to um, do a little bit of its rendering, and then we'll come back to it next time. So adding the monster. And the thing I was saying at the beginning, this monster is going to be animated. It's not just going to have an X and Y location, but it's also going to have what it's doing. Is it moving upwards so that we can render it between tiles if necessary? And how far through that progress is it? So it's going to end up with dealing with some state that's about time, uh, not just about its X and Y location. Um, so let's grow the class. And I'm going to cheat, and I'm going to copy this in to start with. And it will probably have typos in it, because I typed it straight into the slide, I think. It does have typos in it. I've, missed, I've been given it the English spelling of color, for starters, when it wants the American spelling of color. So what I've said, I've said there is a kind of thing that's called a monster. And this kind of thing, it has an X and Y location. Let's start off talking about those. And its constructor, for creating a monster, I can just say I want a new monster at 7, 3. And uh, here it is. And then I've said, well, OK, when you draw yourself, and to start with, this just has a location, we're going to draw it as an ellipse. And so that means we need to get the center. And the center is going to be half the tile height by half the tile height. So I've put half the tile height into a local variable. And I've said, I want to start off with a shape that is an ellipse that's centered at half the tile height, comma, half the tile height, and has axis dimensions of half the tile height, half the tile height. And I want to set it to a vaguely red color. And then to draw it, well, draw my shape at the tile location, x times sprite, tile sprite height, y times tile sprite height. So this is going to work out the top left corner location of the, of the grid square. But then our ellipse, once we've gone to that location, our ellipse is then drawn another, is centered another half the tile height, half the tile height on from that. So this should draw it in the middle of the square. All right, but now I'm going to get my monster into the game. And so, well, let's have my game state have a monster. And so let's go monster M. And so when I create one, let's go M is new monster. And I need to give it an X and Y. Mm, let's just say 7, 3. And then when I'm drawing it, I'm going to need to tell my monster to draw itself. So now I have a little circular monster sitting there. But it's not doing anything. It's just sitting there. So to start with, let's make it pulse maliciously. Oh, I need to. Sorry, I knocked a angle bracket off there so that it wouldn't keep rendering in my editor. Yeah. It's cached it. Let's go and this is an um, so way back when Disney, Disney Pixar, etc. Now um, they came up with a whole bunch of principles of animation, and this is just a little video that I've linked in the slides, which is trying to show their principles of how you animate things, how you give things the illusion of being alive. I'm not going to put all of this in there, uh, but, it, but it's quite fun because it's got things about things squashing and, and stretching to, to go to particular locations. And I thought, let's just do the, um, the really simple version of that. Let's have it pulse between being a, 
a, a, a, a vertical ellipse and a horizontal ellipse. And let's make it do it kind of smoothly. Now, this is where I'm going to ask who here has done mathematics and knows sine waves and cos cosine waves? Almost everyone? Not sure? OK. Um, if not, because we're not so concerned about the exact maths of it, we just want to, um, which one? Let's just go with that one. We just want the fact that this thing kind of goes smoothly. So th this animation here, it shows a circle, and I'm dragging a line around the circle. And the sign is the blue one, the, uh, the horizontal part of the distance to the, 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 to the, to the uh, circumference of that cir circle. And the cosine is the green, uh, is the, uh, oh, sorry, no, we're, we're starting off at the right. So the, the sign is the vertical one. Uh, sorry, the sign is the green one. And the cosine is the blue one, because zero degrees is put at the right, not at the top. Um, but what, what we kind of want to see is just that these things, they, they kind of swoop up and down, but they nicely slow down at the edges. And so it's going to have some deceleration there, and it's going to accelerate, etc. there. And so I'm going to borrow this sine wave for my blooping. And to do this, what I'm going to need to do, I'm going to need now to work out what shape should I be depending on what the time is. And so let's have a variable called how long should my animation cycle take. And let's make that 1,000 milliseconds. And in this calculate the shape, I'm going to need to work out, well, OK, if my animation takes a second, how far through a second am I? And if I'm 3.3 seconds in, I only want to know the 0.3. I don't care that I've done three loops before. I just want to know the 0.3. And so if you haven't come across it before, that little percent there is what's called the mod operator. And that gives you the remainder of a division. So 3,500 mod 1,000. I mean, you divide in neatly three times, but throw that away, and you get the 500 left over. And that's what, what ends up in, 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 uh, in frame point. So this is how far through the cycle am I. And this is going to then work out, well, how far around the angle should I be? Uh, and this is done in radians, which you also might not have come across before. So here, this is mapped in degrees. Radiance is just the idea that instead of measuring a circle in 0 to 360 divisions, let's say it's in 0 to 2 times pi divisions. That's all there is to radiance. It's just a different way of splitting up a circle. <coughs> and so if 2 times pi is the whole circle, then I want to know, well, OK, what fraction of a circle is... Um, so I want to take my fraction of a cycle and apply that as a fraction of a circle... And so that's as a fraction of 2 times pi times radians. Um, and so this is here. 2 pi times the frame point divided by the animation. Now, you have to do something a little bit careful here. This is where types can do interesting things. I want this to be a float because I want it to change smoothly. This is a long. It's a big integer. This is a big integer. If I did 2 pi times frame point divided by animation, the way that processing does its division, it will go, you've got something that's an integer divided by something else that's an integer. I'm going to assume you just want the integer part at the end of it. And so you'd find that you'd end up getting always 0 or 1. It would go 0 and then jump to 1. Uh, which isn't what we want. We want it to go smoothly. We want, the, um, we want this part here to change floating point in, in a decimal way. And so to force that, what I've done is I've said, no, 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 let's do the float. 2 pi is a floating point number. 
times this integer first, because this is then a floating point number, and a floating point number divided by an integer, it's going to automatically assume, oh, well, it's a floating point number divided by an integer. You want a floating point number. And so that angle is then going to come out correctly. We've still got half for the sprite height, but now I've put in a quarter and an eighth. And the reason is that I don't want this thing to bloop all the way down to nothing. I want it to bloop down to, so it's still got a bit of size. Uh, and so I've, I've got it, if you like, that sine curve that goes between 0 and 1, uh, sorry, between 1 and minus 1, times an eighth, and then added a quarter onto it, so it, it should keep some, uh, some body to it, even, uh, even, as it, even as it goes. Now, the next bit's a little bit of animation stuff. If I just had it go between a horizontal ellipse and a vertical ellipse, um, Oops, sorry, times, still times sign. Uh, I could get it so that the height was the addition of the sign and the width was the, was the subtraction of the sign. And so we go thin wide, thin wide, and uh, return that as the shape. Um, if I do that, so instead of uh, my shape is create shape, I'm going to say my shape is calc shape of millis, get the time in milliseconds. I don't need that one now. If I do that, it's going to bloop horizontal and vertical, but it's not going to look very menacing. It's because it's keeping roughly the same volume, and it looks right. And I want it to look like slightly wrong, because this is supposed to be a horrible monster that looks terribly menacing. So I'm instead going to make it add the cosine, because the cosine is not the complete opposite. It's slightly out of phase, so it should start blobbing and changing sides a little bit. And so now I, I, I think that looks more menacing, because it's kind of not quite the same volume all the time. It kind of has something that looks a little bit wrong to it. All right, we're right on time. So the next thing we're going to do is set our monster on patrol and make it not bump into the walls. We'll make it change directions when it, as soon as it hits a wall uh, in growing this. And apologies that this has gone slightly slowly in that you guys have already done object-oriented programming, but I don't know that everyone has, so I do have to introduce it.